This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact. Dangerous drugs on the dark web, just a few clicks away on your cell phone. I'm Jeff Sonier, outside the U.S. courthouse. Stick around, we'll talk to prosecutors cracking down on the buyers and sellers, and to a mother who lost her son to those dangerous drugs. And he's a former protester who won his second term on Charlotte City Council. Meet millennial Braxton Winston, part of a new generation of Charlotte leaders. And have you seen this dancing usher? He's a must-see at sporting events all over town. We'll introduce you. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. We begin with a warning for parents about dangerous drugs you've probably never heard of being bought and sold here in Charlotte in a place you probably didn't know about. And if your kids don't know about it either, consider yourself lucky. We're talking about the dark web. It's that secret side of the internet that's becoming more and more accessible as a source for illegal overseas drugs that are killing young victims and tearing families apart. Carolina Impact's Jeff Sonier joins us from the federal courthouse in Charlotte with more on what law enforcement is doing to stop the problem and what you can do. Yeah, this is where the buyers and sellers of illegal drugs on illegal websites come to face trial and possible prison time. But here's the problem. Right here outside the courthouse, I can use my own iPhone, log into the same illegal drug selling websites that the crooks use. I could even show you how to do it. It's remarkably easy access to the dark web and especially to some darkly dangerous drugs. So fentanyl is a very deadly narcotic and a very small dose is very powerful. It's the drug that prosecutors warn about. That families of victims mourn about. And it's out there and it's in drugs, it's in pills. That's why these federal agents in this FBI video are out here looking for fentanyl. It's a bootleg hospital opioid, cheap and easy to make in overseas labs, 50 times stronger than heroin, morphine. The dealers are buying and selling illegally on the internet, using dark web marketplace sites with names like Silk Road, Alpha Bay. So the dark web basically is the hidden web, the hidden internet that many people do not know about. And Assistant U.S. Attorney Sanjeev Basker says at least two of those dark web investigations led to drug suspects arrested here in the Charlotte area. He was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. Uh, he was purchasing narcotics on the dark web on Silk Road. Law enforcement learned narcotics were being shipped internationally into the United States through Charlotte. What was he doing with what he was purchasing on the dark web? He was selling the narcotics. So what he was doing was purchasing the U47700 in addition to fentanyl and other narcotics and taking them, bringing them to his house, selling them in the greater Charlotte and the Atlanta area. And it's not just drug dealers who are accessing these illegal drug websites on the dark web. Anybody with a little online knowledge and the right apps can buy the same dangerous drugs, or even worse, buy something they don't think is dangerous, but really is. The point is though for the community to understand this is happening, and if you have children to know they have access to these means if they have a smartphone or if they have access to a computer. As a parent, that's frightening. Yeah. They act like an Amazon or like an eBay, if you will, where there's a marketplace where people can uh, purchase and sell illicit things, lower level, perhaps marijuana if you wish, narcotic. And that's what they may be thinking they're receiving, but in fact it's cut with fentanyl or other synthetics that are being sent from China or other parts of the world. It's another version of the narcotic that's being cut or mixed with a separate narcotic to give a stronger kick. If you Often once they've received it and digested it, it is too late. No indication, nothing, no warning at all. That's what fentanyl does to That's folks. That's what fentanyl did that quick. Debbie Dalton's home on Lake Norman is filled with photos and flashbacks, reminders of her son Hunter, who died after a friend gave him drugs laced with fentanyl. He had no idea. The person who gave it to him didn't know. He had no idea. 
you know, I, I mean, it's three years and it's still not real to me. Mm. It is still not real. I, I can be walking along and all of a sudden it's just a punch to the gut. My son was 23, way too young, but he lived an amazing life. And Dalton and says life for her family about. before fentanyl was what Hunter Dalton called the HD life. Yeah. Live that HD life. Yeah, it's only right. It's only right for that HD life, hey. But then came that night, that phone call, that frantic trip to the hospital in Raleigh. But nothing, nothing in this world prepared me for, for what I heard next. When I heard him say Hunter has overdosed, and my husband had to take the phone. And, uh, you know, at that point, we're told that he's, he's headed to the hospital in an ambulance. And we were out of our house in a minute, just racing to Raleigh, trying to get there as quickly as we could. And, and between screaming and, and not being able to breathe and trying to talk to doctors and what's going on with him. And... Had you heard of fentanyl at that point? Never in my life. Never. And then every day, the news just got worse until um, I held his hand after seven days. I, holding his hand, I held his hand as he took his last breath. Hunter's mom holds back tears as she tells that story, right. not just to us, but to school groups, to parents who don't know about these dark web drugs, and to kids who might know more than their parents realize. That's his room. And so it's, it's gonna stay like that with his trophies. She talks about Hunter's room here at home, still the same as it was three years ago, and how everything else will never be the same. You know, if I'd known, you know, that, the what if is a horrible thing. It's just a road you try to stay away from for, as a parent that lost a, a child, but man, if I'd known this. More importantly, if Hunter had. And so, if there's a door that'll open, I'm walking through it. If there's an audience that'll listen to me, I'm gonna talk to them. You know, it's the only thing that keeps me going. You know, it used to be there were two kinds of drugs, the safer recreational drugs over here, the dangerous hard drugs over here. But now, with the dark web and with powerful cheap drugs like fentanyl being mixed in with just about everything, well, you just don't know. And in this case, what you don't know could literally kill you. Amy? That is just a heart-wrenching story, Jeff. Thanks so much for educating us about it. If you want to find out more about dark web drugs and what to look for as a parent, just head to our website at pbscharlotte.org. You'll find links that'll take you to information about these drugs and tell you more about the apps and smartphone icons that are often linked to the dark web and illegal drug websites. Well, here's a name you may not know, but here in Charlotte, it's gotten a lot of notice. Charlotte City Councilman Braxton Winston was new to politics just over two years ago. Last November, he was re-elected to his second term on the City Council, and he was the second highest vote getter. As Carolina Impact's Todd Wallace reports, Winston represents a new generation in city leadership. We take pictures every day, but it's not every day when your picture is seen by millions around the world. I woke up the next morning and that picture was in the bottom right hand corner of Good Morning America. It was September 2016 and Braxton Winston was one of hundreds of people protesting the police shooting death of Charlotte resident Keith Lamont Scott. As tensions rose, Winston says police used tear gas on the crowd. Unable to shout or breathe comfortably, Winston says he took off his shirt to protect his face and lungs and then, in what has become a defining moment, raised his fist to speak for him. I was asking for the police chief to come out. I was asking for the mayor to come out, you know, telling them that this isn't right, but that this doesn't have to be like this. Just come out and, and talk. We are not going anywhere. We're not leaving, so come out and talk to us. The image is reminiscent of a similar iconic photograph. When in 1968, USA Olympic athletes Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their fist in what they said was a cry for human rights. But I knew that, like you said, in that picture, in that Olympic picture, that the fist does mean something. For Winston, it also means the fight for human rights continues. 
and that the police-involved deaths of African Americans across the country helped build the tension that would explode on the streets of Charlotte after the death of Keith Lamont Scott. You constantly tell us what we cannot do. We cannot kneel. We cannot march. However, through his protest of those lost lives, Winston says he found something else. I found my purpose. I found my purpose that night. I really had to do some soul searching of what is this that I'm doing, you know? Um, I knew I had wanted to keep going, but I didn't know necessarily how, what that meant. I knew that I didn't want people to just to follow a fist in a picture. Hi, I'm Braxton Winston, and I'm running for re-election to Charlotte City Council at large. So Winston ran as a Democrat for a seat on the Charlotte City Council and was elected to his first term in 2017. He was re-elected in November of 2019. He says he ran because there had been a lack of leadership from elected and appointed officials, which he believes helped create the climate surrounding the 2016 Charlotte protests. This tactical change in strategy meant now working with the very forces he had been working against. The government is supposed to be for all people. This unlikely turn is just the latest in a life filled with twists. Winston was born in Jacksonville, North Carolina, the son of a military father. Mom was a teacher. The family left Camp Lejeune and moved to Brooklyn, New York, where Winston grew up. Murders and crack cocaine were all around him. But Winston excelled academically in his inner city surroundings and received a scholarship to attend high school at a very different place, the prestigious Phillips Academy Boarding School in Andover, Massachusetts. I know what it's like to live in the projects, um, but I know what it's also like, you know, to go to school with the most the wealthiest people um, in, in the world and the most privileged people in the world. From this affluent world, Winston's next stop was back to North Carolina and Davidson College in 2001. But weeks later, he left college, devastated after the terrorist attacks on September 11th, which happened not far from his New York home. I used to be able to see uh, the towers from my parents' bedroom window. That tragedy greatly depressed him, and he would leave college once more. Winston eventually graduated from Davidson in 2007 with a degree in anthropology, the study of human societies and cultures. If you prepare yourself for the world, when opportunities come to you, you will learn how to take advantage of them. He especially enjoys sharing his message of perseverance with children, like the students here at Ashley Park Elementary School in West Charlotte. Stuff that happened in his life kind of happened in mine. And it inspired me to like try to grow up and be a better person. If you don't make it, you can't just sit there and cry and think about it. You have to come back again as a better person or a better soul. They can get the city they want and deserve. Serving as a councilman is just one of what Winston calls a three-pronged approach to public service. He says activism and using social media to be a citizen journalist also come with his job. Showing up and disseminating facts to people objectively so they can determine their truth. But Winston says by far his most important job is being a father to his three children, ages 4 to 12. He says his role as councilman is kind of an extension. In the end, that's who I'm doing it for, is to try to um, uh, create the, the city, stay in a nation that I want them to inherit. You'll get opportunities to say in, in, in certain situations. That uh, future he's trying to create began as a long, winding, improbable journey from the streets of New York, a raised fist seen around the world, and finally to a seat at the table. For Carolina Impact, I'm Todd Wallace reporting. It's great to get to learn a little more of the backstory. Thanks so much, Todd. Well, Councilman Winston is a professional videographer and recently worked on a sports documentary. He's a sought after speaker, especially around our area in schools. Well, next, we turn our attention now to an icon from our region's past to learn about a Charlotte family and a company that's been here for more than a hundred years. The Lance Peanut Butter Cracker redefined snack foods in the U.S. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis gives us a little history lesson. The Lance crackers, in my totally unbiased opinion, were a much superior cracker to anybody else's cracker. Fresh peanut butter sandwiched between two crackers. It's a simple treat, but one that put Charlotte on the map in the snack food world. You might wonder how it all got started. Well, you have to go back more than 100 years ago to 1913, 
Woodrow Wilson became president, civil rights icon Rosa Parks was born in Alabama, and the Ford Motor Company introduced the assembly line. In Charlotte, textile mills hummed. A one-year subscription to the Charlotte News only cost $6, and a shipping error would lay the foundation for a very unique success story, one definitely for the history books. Lance is, is one of the great success stories of Charlotte and the Carolinas. The invention of the peanut butter snack cracker uh, happened in Charlotte. And we now take for granted the whole snack food industry, but to a large extent, Philip L. Lance pioneered that and it was an accident. Philip Lance was an entrepreneur. He was a food broker here in Charlotte. He specialized in coffee bean sales. One day, when he was picking up an order of coffee beans for a customer, he picked up 500 pounds of raw peanuts instead. So what did he do? He went home to his family kitchen, told his wife, well, I've got these peanuts. She said, let's roast them in the oven and he sold them for a nickel a bag on the corner of Trade and Tryon Street in Uptown Charlotte. By 1915, business was going so well, Philip Lance brought on a partner. He went into business with his son-in-law, Salem Augustus Van Every, my great-grandfather, and they started Lance Packing Company. Now, the reason it was called Lance Packing Company is because the workers actually packed the peanut butter into jars to sell. At first, the company sold roasted peanuts and fresh peanut butter, but in 1915, Lance's wife Nancy and his daughter Mary, who was married to business partner Salem Van Avery, had an idea. And they said, you know what? We could roast those and make them into peanut butter, spread them on crackers, and we could sell them at the textile mills. From the beginning, Lance was a family business. Philip Lance Van Avery was born December 9th, 1913, here in Charlotte. He was one of six brothers, and he started working for the family business right out of high school. He was 18 when he started at Lance. He worked his way up through the company. He believed in hard work. He believed in being very frugal, and he believed in growing his people. In April of 1943, Philip Lance Van Avery's life changed when his father and co-founder of the company, 59-year-old Salem Van Avery, died unexpectedly. His passing left the younger Van Avery at the helm of the family business. Imagine being 29 years old and all of a sudden the world is put on your shoulders. Your grandfather has passed away. Your father has passed away. You have been working for the family company for 11 years straight out of your high school years. So you don't have a whole, whole, whole lot of experience. You've started at the bottom, and all of a sudden, it's yours. That is the situation my grandfather found himself in. Thankfully, he had the wisdom to know that he didn't know how to do it. So he sought the counsel of others. Philip Lance Van Avery took the company started by his grandfather and father from a local success story to national prominence. Lance employed thousands of people and became a multi-million dollar empire. But his most lasting legacy, his family says, was something he put in place in 1961. Perpetuating giving back to the community was very, very important to my grandfather. And so in 1961, he started a foundation which bears his name, the Philip L. Van Avery Foundation. His will stated that 100% of his land stock was to fund this foundation. So when he died in 1980, the foundation was fully funded. The foundation today is worth over $40 million. It is one of the 100 largest foundations in North Carolina. And we are so privileged to give away approximately $2 million a year to worthy organizations that align with the type things he loved and cared about. Philip Lance Van Avery did indeed pay it forward. He took the opportunity to lead the family company, built it into something larger than anyone could have imagined. And it all began with a simple idea that evolved into a beloved snack food across the country. Simple sustenance that built a company, and that company built a pathway to do good in their hometown and beyond. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Who knew my favorite little peanut butter crackers started right here in Charlotte? Thanks so much, Jason. You can learn more about the Lance and Van Every families and the company they built on our Trail of History program. Well, I've always been a people watcher. How about you? If you attend Charlotte sporting events, the entertainment isn't just on the field or on the court, it's in the stands too. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis introduces us to a man in the stands who always stands out. 
If you've been to a Charlotte Knights baseball game in the last few years, the guy's got moved. He's a true host every single night. And he's got a little bit of a following here. Or a Charlotte Hornets basketball game. He is an absolute Charlotte sports legend. Or a Charlotte Checkers hockey game. I went to a game and I was like, wow. Or even a local concert. Oh, there's a pretty good chance you've seen him. He's awesome. And he's always there putting on a good show for the crowd. And really, really fun to watch. In all his dancing glory. This has grown into something that I never imagined. I'm somewhat introverted, and a lot of people find that really hard to believe. In some ways, Jim Kovis is an attraction all himself. You don't know anything about Charlotte sports if you don't know Jim. Known around town as the dancing usher, Jim is a local celebrity of sorts. I would put him above Elaine from Seinfeld. <laughs> and uh, maybe just a notch below, um, I don't know, Fred Astaire. Everywhere he goes, people now recognize him. Entertaining crowds with his moves. And I get a lot more out of it than they do. It's, it's therapeutic for me. And he doesn't do it because he wants himself to get a pat on the back. He does it because he has fun out here and he wants the fans to have fun. It all started about eight years ago when Jim's four sons were in college, all at the same time. His salary as a director at the Arrow Point Federal Credit Union was good, but not good enough to pay four college tuitions. So he went looking for a second job. I saw an ad in the paper for the Charlotte Knights. It was their last season in Fort Mill. They were looking to fill game day positions. At around the same time, Jim was packing on the pounds, and his sons gave him an earful. So I ballooned up to about 265 pounds, and I kept it on. And I looked at some pictures of myself, and I said, you know, they're right. I'm starting to look like a fat dad. And I didn't feel good. <laughs> So I, I started doing, taking Zumba classes and trying not to fall down. And eventually I got fairly good at it. That led to me starting to lose weight. I was sleeping better. I was eating better. Those Zumba moves started carrying over to the baseball stadium. Mary, one of the fe my fellow ushers there, and she started dancing. And so I said, if Mary can dance, I can dance too. And lo and behold, I found that if uh, while they were playing music and they weren't doing anything on the field, that some of the fans kind of got a kick out of it. A year later, when the Knights moved to Uptown, so did Jim. With sold out games, his audience was now bigger than ever. Sweet Carolina. I told him, I told him, I said, you are gonna be famous doing this. So good, so good, so good. Not often you see someone that's willing to dance and kind of uh, just take the spotlight for a little bit just to entertain the fans. He moves better than some 18 year olds out there. It's what minor league baseball is all about and forget that it's what sports are all about. You're there to have a good time. You're there to enjoy yourself and uh, Jim makes that part of the experience. He dances, he sings, he also carries with him an array of handwritten signs, usually with some witty joke written on them, all to keep smiles on the faces of his regulars in section 117. His jokes, they're really funny. He like wakes up in the middle of the night, writes them down, like he'll be in a stoplight and he'll write one down. Among those taking notice of all his antics, the Charlotte Hornets, who then hired Jim three years ago to bring the same kind of energy to their games. The Hornets said, yeah, let's, let's bring this guy on. And so eventually I wound up on the floor and in my little corner at section 115 and 116. He brings so much to being at Hornets games. Like we look forward to coming and sitting in 115 because we're right beside Jim. We're like, hey, we're going to see Jim tonight. And I never really understood performers that said that they did get that energy like from the audience, but I, I do now and I get a lot more out of it than they do. Hey, how are you? Great. It seems like forever since I've been here. And when his schedule permits, Jim also works security at Checkers hockey games. So they usually do the chicken dance between the first and second period. But what most fans don't realize about Jim is that he's in constant pain and should probably be the last person out there dancing. I threw out a disc back in the early 90s chopping a tree down that was knocked down by Hugo in my backyard. Found out I had spinal stenosis too, which is a narrowing of the spinal canal, kind of an arthritis related thing. So I had bone growth between L4 and L5 growing into the nerve that they had to cut out. If anybody was to see me going up the parking lot after a checkers game or, or trying to walk to the link station, they'll, they'll look at me and say, aren't you the dancing guy? And, and almost, you can barely walk. He walks with a noticeable limp, 
but still wipes down all the seats in his section before every night's game. It's tough to get a real good night's sleep. My legs tingle. It's hard going in and out of a car. I realize that eventually I'll probably need a spinal fusion based on what my spine doctor has told me. But it's that interaction with fans, helping to put smiles on their faces, that keeps him coming back. When you see joy on a child's face, there's nothing like it. He's one in a million. We got upset one season because we thought he wasn't here. Without him, it would definitely be like a whole different experience. Because of the pain, Jim isn't sure how much longer he can keep this pace up. At some point, one or more of the local teams will likely lose his services. But I'll do it until I can't. But hopefully, that's not for a long, long time. I don't have to do any of that. I just do it. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. What a character. Thanks so much, Jason, for sharing his story. As of now, Jim is planning on working the upcoming season with the Knights, which kicks off their season in April. In the meantime, you can catch him at most Hornets games. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for this evening, my friends. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time. Good night. Production of PBS Charlotte.